Dr. Adam Weiss, and today we're going to discuss ESL methods. In particular, we're going to discuss the PSYOP model, which was developed by Echevarria and colleagues. So this comes from the PSYOP textbook, and we're going to discuss chapters 1 and 2 today. Okay, let's first begin by discussing and providing an overview of what is the PSYOP model. So the PSYOP model contains um, several different elements, and we're going to discuss each of them. Today we're going to focus on lesson preparation, but um, there are other elements as well, including building background, which would be basically activating students' prior knowledge, comprehensible input, which be, would be making sure that you're providing instruction that students understand, and that's meaningful for students at different language levels, strategies, so particular techniques you can use to um, support students' learning, interaction, how you can support students' collaboration and discussion, building their oral language skills, practice and application, how students could um, practice with the content material to make sure that they're understanding it, and then delivering your lesson, and then finally having a review at the end of your, set, at the end of your lesson where you discuss your key topics and your objectives, and then finally, assessment, where you are evaluating whether students were successful in learning the content. So, like I said earlier, today we're going to discuss lesson preparation. And to begin, we're just going to review a little bit about the diverse characteristics of ELL students, or English language learners. So, um, as you'll see, and as we've talked about in other um, videos, English language learners come into U.S. schools with a variety of different proficiencies in English. And they also come to U.S. schools with a variety of different proficiencies in their native language as well. So if you think about their proficiencies in English, depending on how much exposure to English students have had at home, um, their English could be um, at maybe a conversational level. Maybe they were speaking English to their siblings or even to their parents. and um, to maybe their neighbors and watching TV and playing games in English. So they might have a conversational level. Some of the students, especially students that maybe were born and raised in the United States, but you also might have English language learners that even lack that conversational proficiency because maybe at home they almost all, always spoke in their native language. Or you could also have English language learners that are newcomers to the United States that were born in a foreign country and they have immigrated to the United States. And so um, while they were living in their native country, they were speaking their native language um, with everyone, most people they interacted. And then when they came to the United States, they were exposed to English. So it really depends on um, students' English level. We can't assume that they have no English exposure, and we can't assume that they're fluent English speakers either. And especially, we can't assume that they have academic language. Most likely, if they are classified as an English language learner, that means that they are still not completely academically proficient in English. And so that means that they're still needing to develop that academic vocabulary, those complex sentences. Um, they're needing to develop um, their ability to express higher order thinking skills through their speaking and reading and writing. The good news is, though, that many ELL students do have a, at least a conversational proficiency in their native language, and some will also have formal schooling or formal education in their native language. And so the good thing is, Many skills can transfer from students' first language to their acquisition of English. So you still want to encourage students to develop their native language. Um, you can do this by providing resources in the classroom, like texts in students' native language. You might let them watch instructional videos in their native language. Or, um, not just or, but and, you should also encourage parents to continue to develop students' native language. So encourage parents to, to continue to have conversations with students in their native language, read to their students in their native language, um, read with students once students are now able to read, um, read with students 
in, with books that are written in students' native language and watch maybe um, documentaries that are, that are age appropriate in students' native language. All of these things would, would help develop students' native language and those skills will directly transfer to English. So um, unfortunately, there are groups of English language learners that are most at risk of academic struggle. And these are the English language learners that never really fully developed their native language, and they're still struggling to develop English. So basically, they're, they are having difficulty with both languages, and so they're not really proficient, um, co at least academically, in either language. And so even if you provided those students with a bunch of native language materials and you assess them in their native language, they still might struggle. Um, they still might not be successful. So those are the students that seem to have the most difficulty. And when those ELL students stay in U.S. schools for many years and they've been classified as an English language learner for um, more than five years, in general we call them long-term English learners. And these are the students that, especially when they get into junior high and high school, we really start um, as educators to be concerned about them because that indicates that they have been uh, struggling for several years to develop academic language in English. And as we've talked about in other videos, um, the CALP, which is the Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency, the academic language, should take about five to ten years for a student to develop. So after a student's been in U.S. schools and been and has been receiving English instruction for um, let's say 10 years. So let's say they started school when they were in pre-K at four and now they're 14 and they're still classified as an English language learner and they're still in ESL classes in junior high and high school. Then we start to be concerned about that student because that student still hasn't acquired that academic language and they should have acquired it overall by that time. So unfortunately those long-term English language learners often are concerned for many school districts. And many times these are students that have been born in the United States, but for some reason or another, they never received strong instruction in either language. They never, especially they did not develop their native language. Um, they might be able to converse in their native language, like um, speak with their family and friends, but they're struggling to read and write in their native language. And they're also having, um, below grade level English skills. So those students are the ones that are most at risk of dropping out or um, ha experiencing school fa failure. And so these are the students we really need to support. The good news is that the PSYOP model can help support these students and many other English language learners. So that's why we're going to learn about it. So, um, when you're teaching English language learners, it's important to think about some of the struggles they might face. So um, English language learners are more likely to, than um, the average student to live in poverty. And this could be because um, their parents are maybe first generation immigrants or um, their parents might lack uh, English proficiency. And so that normally means well, statistically that their parents will have lower paying jobs. Not always, but it can mean that. Um, some ELL students are undocumented, so they are having that political or legal stress of worrying about their status as um, their citizenship status. And many of them also um, might feel decreased academic motivation because if they don't have documentation and it's hard for them to to work in professional fields that require uh, citizenship or um, permanent residency, those students might lack uh, the motivation because they just simply are realistic and realize it's going to be very difficult for them. It's not impossible at all, but it can be more difficult for them to attend college and to work in a professional career. So that could be um, upsetting for students. And then, of course, if there's any immigration legal proceedings going on with students, that can be very uh, stressful for them as well. Um, mobility or absenteeism can be, can be something that English language learners often experience, and that can tie into poverty. It could also tie into documentation status. Um, 
And it could also just be tied into um, just economic trends, you know, families moving. Some ELL students have post-traumatic stress, um, and this could especially be true for refugee students that came to the United States uh, fleeing um, either famine or um, fleeing war or discrimination in their home countries. And so many times those students have post-traumatic stress, and they might even have several years of uh, a lack of academic instruction. They might have missed formal education for several years because they had to live in refugee camps that lacked formal education. Um, other issues might be that parents uh, have low parental education. This is not true for all ELL students, but ELL students overall are more likely to have parents that are less educated than native English speakers. Um, and that's just because there's not as many educational opportunities in many countries that people uh, immigrate to the United States. So in many countries, education is very expensive. It's not universal and given to every person. Um, and, some, and fortunately, in the United States, our educational system is very effective, and we focus on educating all people. And that's not always true in other countries. And so if there is to, if families are leaving those countries to, to look for better opportunities in the United States, then many of those parents might not have had that opportunity to get formal educate as much formal education as someone who was born and raised here in the United States. Um, there's also other issues. So ELL students are more likely to be misdiagnosed for special education. And many times this is because educators um, assume that a language difference or a language exceptionality or a language difficulty is linked to a cognitive difficulty, and that's not the case. Um, just as we talked about earlier, it takes from five to ten years for students to learn academic language. So um, if an English language learner is still not on grade level um, after five or six years in U.S. schools, that might be just because they're still developing their academic language. It doesn't necessarily mean they have a learning exceptionality. Another um, struggle that ELL students face is that they're often under-identified and underrepresented in GT programs, gifted and talented programs. So they're less likely to be identified and tested and also less likely to be placed in gifted and talented programs. So you might have English language learners that are very proficient in their native language and are very advanced or they have a strong content knowledge and they have strong critical thinking skills. They just need to develop their English language skills and those students um, could possibly be great candidates for the gifted and talented programs that really challenge students and enrich their education. Um, however, because they're, they're, um, the school districts might lack abilities to test students in their native language in gifted and talented programs, or just they'll be, um, there could just be um, misinformation or uh, misconceptions by educators who run those programs. That, then that could lead to a student failing to be properly identified and included in a gifted and talented program. So let's now talk about, we mentioned it a little bit, but e English language learners can transfer several skills from their first language to English. And so that's why we still need to encourage their first language as much as possible. So even if you're an ESL teacher and you're teaching primarily in English to your students, and most likely, if you're an ESL teacher in Texas or in other states, you probably will have a mixture of students. You might have students that are um, ESL or English language learners, and you also might have students that are native English speakers. So you're going to maybe have a variety of, of students, and you'll probably deliver most of your instruction in English. However, just because you're delivering that instruction in English does not mean you cannot encourage students' native language. So. We want to encourage students' native language, and you can go back in the video and see how to do that. But, um, and this is why. So several skills transfer from students' native language to English. First of all, oral language skills. So phonics, vocabulary, um, cognates. So like, for example, in English, science, and in Spanish, ciencia. They sound the same and mean the same. Um, affixes and roots, like um, in, for example, as a prefix, is um, the same 
in English and in Spanish. It means not. Um, or re or re means to do again, and that's the same prefix in English and in Spanish. So, so many affixes and roots can be, uh, and also root words. Uh, a lot of root words come from Latin, and so um, many, if students speak uh, Latin-based languages like Spanish, Italian, French, um, Portuguese, then they're more they're likely to be able to transfer some of those uh, root words into English, like aqua for water. Listening comprehension strategies can also be transferred. So knowing um, that when you're listening to someone, you need to look at them or to um, look at their gestures or their facial expressions or what um, maybe any uh, visuals they're providing. So listening co um, comprehension strategies can transfer. Having the ability to, to ask the person to slow down or to repeat what they said, um, knowing that you can do that and, to, and that will help you better understand the speaker, that can transfer from knowing that how to ask for help in your native language. You can transfer that to recognizing you need to ask the speaker to slow down or repeat themselves in English. Many literacy skills can transfer from students' native language to English. So if you think about it, if a student knows how to summarize in their native language or they know how to make an inference based on textual evidence, like drawing a conclusion, um, they are able to find the main idea, they're able to describe characters, all of these things, if they understand that in their native language, they can transfer that knowledge to English. They'll still need to, of course, learn the vocabulary to explain it, and, you know, the syntax, the sentence structure to be able to explain it, but they'll be able to know that concept of, hey, characters will change in a story, or me as a read, I, excuse me, I as a reader should choose what are the most important elements of a text to help summarize it in my mind. Or authors create Authors of fiction often write with themes or lessons that we can use to our lives. So when I'm hearing a fiction story, I should start to consider what is the theme. Another thing is content knowledge transfers from students' native language to English. So if students learned a lot about math topics or science topics, and they have a really strong science foundation, for example, or social studies foundation in their native language, they can transfer those that knowledge to English. They'll, of course, have to learn the English terms, but they still know the concepts. Sometimes uh, ELL students will also know how to be an effective translator or to navigate between different cultures because they've had to translate for their parents or their uh, classmates or their family members. So be, having that language broker skills can also transfer to um, English. Having cultural funds of knowledge can be very uh, beneficial and can transfer to English. So if a student knows a lot about different weather patterns because maybe they, they worked in agriculture, their family, not maybe they didn't, but maybe their family had an agricultural um, farm or business or they worked in agriculture. Or maybe um, children have a strong knowledge of their native cultural traditions and um, the different groups of people that live that um, that live in the in different parts of the world, they have strong cultural knowledge that they can transfer um, when they're learning skills in English, content in English, and then life experiences too. So maybe they've had a lot of opportunities to experience uh, and use electricity and magnets. Maybe they've uh, helped their parents with uh, electric tasks or, or tasks that involve magnets, or maybe they've done a lot of cooking, so they have a lot of chemistry background, or maybe um, they have a lot of experience with certain occupations like law or um, business in their home countries. And so they can transfer that into when they're learning skills and concepts in English. So it's also very important that we discuss the difference between um, or we go into more detail about academic language and literacy. So academic language and literacy is not something that you just naturally pick up through having conversations or hearing people talk. 
academic language normally has to be explicitly taught, and people learn it in schools. Um, so academic language includes higher level vocabulary terms, more complex sentence patterns, like so longer sentences, and sentences that are connected with conjunctions like and or but, or sentences with clauses like that start with that or which. Um, academic language also could be more abstract forms of expression. It's not directly um, stated the main idea, the, the point. You have to kind of make inferences and um, kind of decide for yourself. Also, academic language is what we use when we're doing academic tasks, like when we're summarizing, when we're comparing and contrasting, when we're explaining our points of view or arguing a position or um, pointing out slight differences or nuances. And then academic language, it's, this is really important to note, academic language will not just be a second language for your ELL students, it's most likely going to be a second language for most of your students because they're probably not getting a lot of academic language at home. Most of the time their family members and the TV and media are using informal, basic, casual language or the BICs. Um, which is the basic interpers interpersonal communication and skills. So that's just the basic casual conversational language that students hear every day. And that's what they, even your native English speakers, they might, when before they start school, they might be more familiar with just the informal casual language, and then they're still having to learn the CALP, the academic language, in school. So now we're going to talk about how the PSYOP model originated. So the PSYOP model basically combined the concepts of content-based ESL programs with sheltered content instruction. So content-based ESL programs are basically where students are still receiving grade level instruction and in content. However, they are also having the language presented during the lesson be modified and differentiated so that students can understand it. So basically students are not falling behind because they're still learning grade level objectives in Texas we call them the TEKS, so grade level standards and objectives and content, but they're being supported and receiving differentiated instruction so that that they can still learn grade level content, but the language that it's taught is at students' current language level. Another thing that SIOP combined was the concept of sheltered content instruction. Um, and the main part of that was that um, SIOP basically argued that you cannot teach an ELL student and a native English speaker the same way. So you need to provide dif differentiation. And many times that differentiation can be in small groups with you leading that, those groups as a teacher. Or it can also be when you're pairing um, ELL students with non-ELL students, native speakers. And those native speakers can support the ELL student by modeling correct pronunciation, correct grammar, correct um, or more elaborate sentence structure and phrasing and um, academic vocabulary. So, and we want to also explain that PSYOP, the PSYOP model has been proven to be successful in several research studies. And then there's also something to note that this is an ESL program. This is for an ESL classroom. This is not for a bilingual classroom per se. So the research actually shows that bilingual programs are more effective than ESL programs. So bilingual programs that incorporate a significant amount of native language instruction during the school day have actually been shown to, to lead to better results for English language learners. However, in some school districts, they just will not have the resources to provide bilingual programs for every different language that, stu that exists. So if um, there is only a few students that speak Vietnamese in a, lang in a district, or there's only a few people that speak Swahili, the district will not have the resources to hire a, um, a bilingual teacher, and there might not be enough curriculum materials that are, at, um, that are in that student's native language or grade level to justify having a bilingual program. So those students who are English language learners and who are speaking those uh, minority languages 
will most likely be placed in an ESL program just because there's a lack of resources in that district. And so when that happens, we have to think of, okay, so ESL programs are the reality in many districts. Ideally, it would be wonderful to have bilingual programs in each of the student's native languages, but unfortunately, ESL programs are the reality in many uh, school districts. They're the only option for many times for native Vietnamese speakers or native French speakers or uh, native Portuguese speakers or native Arabic or Mandarin speakers. So in those cases, for those English language learners who are native speakers of those languages, then many times they're placed in ESL programs. And so of the ESL programs, content-based instruction, which the PSYOP model is a form of content-based instruction, content-based instruction is, has been the most successful form of ESL program. So that's why we're going to learn it today, because many of you are going to become ESL certified teachers for either because you are not fluent in another language other than English, or maybe you are fluent in another language than English, but you've chosen to focus on ESL rather than become a bilingual teacher. Either way, you are wanting to learn how to deliver ESL methods, and you will be teaching in an ESL classroom, and so we are going to teach you the best and a very effective model, which is content-based English instruction, uh, and one of the better models is the PSYOP model, which I, as I mentioned earlier, has been supported by research. So now let's get into some specifics about lesson planning. So, first of all, the first feature of the PSYOP model in terms of lesson planning is the idea that teachers should include content objectives. So your content objective is, another way to say it is your lesson objective. Your content objective is the facts, the information, the skills, the knowledge that you want students to learn in that particular content area. So math, science, social studies, language arts. In Texas, we get them from the TEKS, or text, depending on how you pronounce it. And I gave you a link to those. But, um, so those are your kind of your learning goals. And when you're writing your content objectives, you want to make sure that you choose, you only pick one or two at a time, like one or two at a day or one or two per lesson, because you don't want to overwhelm students. If they're having to remember too many different new skills at once, it can be overwhelming and frustrating and students are less likely to remember. You also want to make sure that when you write out your content objective, which you should share with your students, you should share at the beginning of the lesson, today we are going to learn blank. Or today we're going to learn the, um, the characteristics of 2D and 3D shapes. Well, whenever you write that out, you need to make sure you provide it with student-friendly language that students can understand. You also want to make sure that your objectives are specific and measurable. So, in that objective I said, I just mentioned, it was pretty specific because it said 2D shapes and we're learning the attributes. But I probably could modify that to make it more measurable. So how are we going to measure whether students understood the concept or not? So maybe I could modify that by saying, students will learn the attributes and characteristics of 2D shapes by writing an expository essay. So that demonstrates how they're going to show their knowledge. Or by analyzing different shape, different given shapes. So that they're going to have to look at different shapes and, and identify the shape's name, the characteristics like the number of sides, um, the, yeah, the number of sides, the type of lines that form the sides, etc. Or the type of angles that are in those shapes. Often it's also a nice idea to, when you're writing a content objective, to start with the students as the subject, because you want the students to feel like they're directly involved in the learning. So the students will be able to, and that's a good way to start writing content objectives. Um, and of course this is kind of common sense, but when, you're, when you establish your content objective for the lesson, you want to make sure you tie your lesson directly to that content objective. Um, and we mentioned already, but you want to review objectives at the beginning of your lesson to tell students kind of 
give them a framework and a main idea for where the purpose of their learning. You also want to remind them throughout the lesson what they've learned and how that ties into the objective for the day. And then finally, at the end of the lesson, you want to review the objective to just kind of reaffirm and to uh, reiterate what was the main learning that occurred during the lesson. A second thing that's important, this is unique to the PSYOP model, and it's a, a very wonderful concept, is the idea that in addition to content objectives, teachers should provide language objectives for students. And this is Language objectives should be provided for all students in whatever classroom you're teaching. However, these language objectives will be especially beneficial for English language learners, but you should provide them to all students. So language objectives are similar content objectives, and it's like the skills, the concepts, the information that students are expected to learn. However, the language objectives are focused only on language and on English language skills. So specifically, you're going to pick a English language goal for the lesson. So your language objective can include different elements. It can um, include um, such things as what types of uh, vocabulary students will learn during the lesson, what types of grammar structures they'll use, like including verb tenses, will they use the present tense, past tense, will they learn punctuation, capitalization, what will they focus on with grammar? Um, also, it could also be how students will use the four domains of language in their lesson. So listening, speaking, reading, and writing. How will they use all four of those domains during the lesson? And I'm going to just go back. But you need to make lesson or language objectives that match students' language proficiency level. So if you have, if most of your English language learners are beginners uh, or intermediate, so they have kind of, they're still developing that basic conversational English, then most of your language objectives will be focused on oral language, like being able to communicate in the present tense, or learning the new vocabulary terms that are related to the lesson. Um, speaking in complete sentences with detail. All of those things would be relevant to the students at that level. Now, if most of your ELL students are advanced and advanced high, you're going to focus primarily on um, academic language and you're going to focus um, on kind of more complex skills that are academic related. So, and, and mostly these skills will be involving reading and writing because students have already, if they're advanced and advanced high, they've probably already acquired that conversational language ability. So now they're really just trying to uh, further perfect their writing and their reading. So they're trying to read on grade level and they're also trying to uh, read uh, more complex text. They're also trying to uh, write on grade level with current with more and more description and with um, different forms of writing genres like persuasive text, persuasive writing, um, in expository writing where they're describing a real thing, or um, personal narratives where they're describing themselves. Now, so I'm going to give some examples of some good language objectives. And I took one from, um, well, actually, I'm going to give an example of both a language objective and a content objective. So we're actually going to go back a little bit. So for the content objective, I picked sixth grade, just to kind of pick like a middle grade in between elementary and junior high and high school. So the sixth grade social studies objective in Texas, one of them is, Students will be able to identify and explain how geographic factors affected population patterns in North America. So I kind of modified that um, a little bit. So you could probably make that a little bit more measurable as well. So you might say, students will be able to explain population patterns in North America by writing a short paragraph on changes in population in the 18th century or something. I don't know. So you can make it more specific and more measurable. But um, either way, so that's our content objective. So it's basically geographic factors and how they affect population patterns in North America. Now, 
And remember, that was for the content top area of social studies. Now we're going to focus on our language objective based off that content objective. So our language objective could be for day one, might be students could first orally tell the difference between the present and past tense when they're reading text about population patterns. Day two, the next day, you might have a language objective where that's more complicated. So students will be able to or orally explain when to use the present tense and past tense when um, they're describing population patterns. And they will use evidence from their readings to help them justify their definition. Then days three and four, it might you could, might have students will correctly write sentences in both the present and the past tense to correctly describe population patterns. So as you can see in the beginning of the week, we were focusing primarily on receptive language skills, listening and, um, and reading. And then later in the week, we were focusing on productive language skills, which was um, speaking and writing. So, we got our, already kind of mentioned this already, but when you're designing your objectives, make sure you consider students' um, level of English language proficiency. And the one way you can do that in Texas is by looking at their, um, their LPAC score or um, looking at uh, another way to do that is look at the TELPASS score, which is a form of English language evaluation we use in Texas. And you can look at that from the previous year, and that will tell you their different um, proficiency levels in um, the four domains of language, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Uh, another thing that you must consider, and I forgot to mention this, but language objectives, a great way, resource, to go back to language objectives, a great resource for finding language objective, objectives in Texas are the ELPS, the English Language Proficiency Standards. The only thing is, when you use the ELPS for your language objectives, the ELPS are for grades K through 12. So they're not specific to each individual grade level. Rather, they're specific to um, each different um, student's English level. So they'll have ELPS for beginning English speakers. They'll have ELPS for intermediate speakers, ELPS for advanced speakers, and ELPS for advanced high speakers. And once again, this is determined through the TELPASS assessment, which will be documented in students' um, LPAC. And I've actually made another video on my uh, YouTube channel that you can see to discuss uh, the different TELPASS levels and the different uh, classifications in Texas of English language learners. So another thing is when you're creating objectives in general, you also want to think about what background knowledge students have, and that could be background knowledge in their native language or in English, what level of literacy skills they have, both in their native language and in English, how difficult um, the text will be that you provide to students, will, will, will it be at students' reading level, and what kind of scaffolds or support students will need to understand that text, and then also whether or not the content you're teaching is culturally and age appropriate. So you want to make sure that it, it relates to students' native cultures and it has um, meaning to them and it doesn't assume certain cultural knowledge. Also, you want to make sure that the content is age appropriate. So even if you're differentiating their reading level so that the students are reading texts that are more simplistic and maybe at a lower reading level than the grade they're in, you still want to introduce them with grade level content that is appropriate for their age. So you, you might have fifth grade students that need texts that are written at a second grade level, that are written uh, in more simplistic sentences, they have less complicated vocabulary, they have uh, more visuals or um, maybe embedded vocabulary terms that explain the definition of the term. But you want to make sure that that student still has exposure to fifth grade concepts. So if you're giving them a fifth grade reading on... Um, different animals in their habitats, you want to make sure that they're, you're still teaching them grade level content that's fifth grade level, 
but you can modify or differentiate the type of text they're reading. So now we're going to talk about how we can provide age-appropriate um, content while also making it accessible. So in general, just like I me just mentioned, you want to make sure you provide grade level content so that's appropriate for students age level and grade, but you want to make it accessible for students. And so a way you can do that is you can pre-teach vocabulary at the beginning of the lesson so to kind of build their back background knowledge and to not have students be confused when you're introducing new terms. You can once again, provide them simplified reading or modified reading text that are at their reading level. You could provide them visuals and demonstrations of what you're about to teach because that can make the learning much more real. You can have further modeling and guided practice opportunities where students are working with you as the teacher or with their peers. So having several different examples can help students, not just teaching one example and going straight to the assignment. Another thing is you can activate students' prior knowledge by asking them reflective questions like what do they remember about a, another topic, um, what, what did they learn from a previous grade, or how do you say these different terms in their native language, um, all of the, or doing a physical demonstration or illustration, all of those things, or showing a video, an instructional video at the beginning of a lesson, all of those things can um, activate their background knowledge which will give them more, will make what you're about to teach them the new information more comprehensible and understandable. And you can also pre-teach students' background knowledge if, if you're worried they might not have it. So let's say you're teaching um, the water cycle. Well, in order to understand the water cycle, you also have to understand the sun's energy and solar energy, right? Because that heats up the water and makes it evaporate, which forms eventually... Um, condenses and forms into clouds. So if students don't understand that the sun is a star that provides a significant amount of solar energy that affects Earth, then they're not going to understand the water cycle. So you're going to have to go back and make sure they have that, that prior background knowledge about the sun's energy and solar energy before you end up started teaching a more complex topic, the water cycle. Um, so there's also some ways that you can provide a mini lesson or pre-lesson to kind of activate students' prior knowledge. So you could provide a text or picture walk. You could do a hands-on activity. You could, have a, a, you could have them discuss the content with their peers and have peer tutors. You could teach a topic in their native language or show a video of the topic you're about to teach in their native language. You could have role-playing where some students demonstrate what they already know for students that might have less background knowledge. And so all these things are great ways to activate prior knowledge. Another thing that we can focus on is that you want to make sure that you're providing your English language learners with supplementary material. So this is the fourth feature of the SIOP model. So the SIOP model argues that you need to provide supplementary materials which um, to a high degree or often, like every day and regularly, so that you can make your lesson clear and meaningful. And so um, supplementary materials are beneficial because they allow for different types of learning styles. So many supplementary materials involve hands-on learning experiences. So that's beneficial for your kinesthetic learners. Also, they involve many of them uh, involve visual learning. So that's good for your visual learners. And then many um, different supplementary materials are collaborative in nature. They students work together in groups to use those materials, and so that would benefit the auditory and interpersonal um, learning styles as well. So now let's talk about what are some examples of supplementary materials. Well, supplementary materials could be technology, it could be manipulatives, which are, which are basically like counters or tools that students can manipulate or move around to solve problems or to use in their learning. It could be realia or real objects, so like maybe a real image, a real rock, or a real piece of uh, a plant, or um, maybe a, a real um, square shape. Uh, supplementary materials could also be pictures and visuals. Other supplementary materials could be high-low reader sets or thematic reading sets. 
And so they would have topics on, on, a, on a common theme, let's say like the rainforest or under the sea, or, for, or maybe like the economy, like financial literacy, but they'll have a variety of texts at different reading levels that could be accessible for students of different reading levels. Other supplementary materials could be providing a chapter summary at the end of a textbook. You could have adapted text where you um, modify the text to, to shorten the sentences, include vocabulary terms with the definitions at the bottom of the page. You might uh, break up the text into shorter chunks so it's more um, less cognitive load for students. You could also provide first language supports. That's a supplementary material. So that could be providing text written in students' native language or um, oral language to, um, information about the topic through the form of podcasts or video clips or audiobooks. You could provide summaries of the text. And you could do this, a great way to do this is through using either an outline or graphic organizer. And the graphic organizers are especially beneficial because it's it supports visuals um, and it organized thoughts and thinking for students, which makes um, it much more um, structured, their understanding of a text or of a topic. You could also um, just provide additional elaboration. So you could provide, um, include definitions of difficult words, provide additional background information, provide additional books on the topic or a different additional um, ways students can learn more about the topic. You can also provide note-taking devices and support, like fill-in-the-blank notes or guided notes. All of those would be a form of supplementary materials. Another thing that we have to remember is when we provide our instruction for students, we want to make sure that we plan meaningful activities that involve not only content learning, but also language practice. So they're learning grade level content, they're learning grade level math, science, social studies, language arts, but they're also learning and improving their English language skills. So when you're teaching a lesson, your lesson should include ways that students can use all four domains of language. So within your lesson, there should be a time where students are listening, students are speaking and discussing content either with their peers or with you, Students are reading about the topic at their reading level, and students are writing about the topic. So here are some meaningful activity examples that are really beneficial. One of them is called project-based learning. So project-based learning is a great strategy because basically um, it's a very authentic learning experience. And this is important. You want your, your activities to be authentic in nature. And so by authentic, we mean they are relevant to the real world and they would be meaningful to students because they can directly relate to it. So project-based learning is very authentic and relevant to the real world because basically students are thinking of a problem in their community or thinking about a uh, project that could be completed in their community and then they're taking plans to create that project to help. So they're researching on the topic, which involves reading, they're listening to the news, or listening to educational videos, which involves listening domains. Um, they're writing a report about what they've learned and their proposed solution, justifying their solution with evidence from what they've read and what they've heard. And then they're presenting their findings to the class, which would involve speaking. So it involves all four language domains. Another meaningful activity could be jigsaw reading. And jigsaw reading is basically where you assign, you break students off into, or you separate students into different groups, and then you give them different texts for each group. And within that group, students read the text together as a small group, and they discuss it. Then you later switch up the groups so that now the groups are totally um, switched now that students will be with a new group and within that new group, all of those students will have read a different text on a similar topic, let's say a rainforest. And so what will happen is each student will share what they read in their text to their new group. And later that group will write down or, or represent some way what they've learned from those four different texts from each student sharing what they learned in each of their texts. And then they'll present it to the class. So it's basically a way for students to do peer teaching 
and peer tutoring while also providing variety because students are reading different texts and learning different things from their peers. Um, another thing that we need to do is make sure you provide differentiation. We kind of mentioned that already, but you want to make sure you provide uh, content for various students. So you want to provide content for students at different cognitive levels or academic levels. So if students are below grade level in content, let's say math or science or social studies, and they need additional support, then you're going to need to make sure you provide small group remediation and reteaching the concepts in a different way to those students. You also need to provide language differentiation for your English language learners, so making sure you differentiate and teach the content based on students' language ability that so they can understand. And we're going to get into that in a little bit more detail in other lessons. But also, for students who are performing above grade level, you're going to want to make sure you provide enrichment so you challenge those students. So now we're going to talk about some other meaningful activities that could integrate content and language practice. So these activities specifically provide additional ways to, to connect content with language. So one of them would be sentence starters or stems. So when you provide sentence starters or stems, it's kind of like providing a fill in the blank or a start of a sentence and then students complete the rest. Like, I learned that, and then students will complete the rest. Or in the text, it says that blank. Or um, that is, um, my solution would be blank, because blank. So all of those things help guide and model correct phrasing, and it helps get students started when they're speaking orally and also when they're writing. It helps model correct phrasing in academic uh, work. So another thing is leveled study guides. So in leveled study guides, these are nice because um, basically you're asking questions based on students' language ability. Also on, based on students' uh, content understanding. So at the beginning of your lesson, you might ask kind of very basic, simple questions, like straightforward questions, like who was the first president of the United States? But then later in the lessons, when you've talked about the content repeatedly, you might ask more complex questions to students, like, why was it important to have a president versus a king in the United States? Um, and then once again, leveled study guides, guides are nice because not only can you differentiate based on students' um, thinking or cognitive uh, level, like what if, you know, below grade level, on grade level, and above grade level, but you can also differentiate based on language abilities. So you could have a, a, a study guide for students who are beginner ELL students, students who are intermediate, students who are advanced, and students that are advanced high. And in the study guide, you might th include things like um, notes about difficult passages in the text, you might give them um, a summary of the text. You might give them uh, specific page numbers to answer certain questions or paragraph numbers to help them answer the questions. Highlighted text is a nice way um, that can, it's a form of supplementary material that can also be meaningful for students because it's showing students what are the most important elements of the text or if they're listening to a selection that's read to them, what is being read so they can follow along. Anchor charts are a great meaningful activity because it helps, um, they're conducted with the teacher and the student. And basically the teacher and the student build kind of like a study guide on a certain topic, kind of like the steps you must take to do this task. So like what are the steps to solving an addition problem? Or what are the steps to uh, writing a complete sentence? And then the teacher will draw the anchor chart and um, include text and images and then post it in the classroom and students can repeatedly refer to that throughout the year. You could create personalized dictionaries where students write down um, new vocabulary terms they've, word, they've learned and it could be something they keep throughout the year and um, it could be based on, of course, organized by each letter of the alphabet and you could even make them bilingual where students, um, and picture-based. So you could have 
the English word, you could have um, a student-friendly definition, a picture, and then maybe the translation in students' native language. And we talked about this already, but native language support was very beneficial and meaningful to students. So providing uh, either yourself providing instruction to students in their native language, asking their parents to do that and support them and read to them in their native language at home, having students' peers work together using native language texts, or letting students watch videos or instructional videos in their native language. All of those things would be meaningful to students because it directly connects what they know in their native language to the new content information you're teaching the students in English. Graphic organizers are very meaningful ways to expose students to both content knowledge and language because basically it organizes students' thinking and organizes students' thoughts in a visual way, which is accessible for many students. And it uses language, but it's not an overwhelming amount of language. We talked about manipulatives and hands-on learning activities, such as base 10 blocks in math, uh, fraction strips, um, science experiments, number lines, thermometers, rulers, clocks. And then in reading, you could have also have hands-on learning activities like sentence strips, magnetic letters, different um, center activities or center games. Many times they, they involve like um, connecting two pieces together or uh, reading rods. And then we talked about guided notes a little bit, but here's some more examples or some pictures. So guided notes would be where you, the teacher, are kind of helping students see what's the most important elements of the task or the topic or the reading. And then you're helping students kind of jot down that information. So they're not having to find them. They're not having to search for the most important facts. They know that what are the most important facts. And also it's not, it's supporting students by not having them write every single part of the note so they can focus on learning the content. So they're, they're filling in the, the, the really relevant parts of the notes. We talked about leveled readers, which are very important. There's some great websites there, News ELA and ReadWorks.org. Those are great places where you can provide, you can see, they'll actually give you like grade level content. Let's say you want to learn about, um, I don't know, different habitats. Well, they'll have those, those, uh, so especially like ReadWorks, that will have differentiated text on different reading levels. Like you might have a fourth grade text about habitats, but you might have a, this, a similar text that's basically written by the same author, but used in a more simpli written in a more simplistic way that's at a second grade reading level. And then News ELA is nice because News ELA basically gives students news articles and it's at different uh, reading levels. So once students get into high school or have a really high reading level, you're going, they're going to be reading news articles that come from major newspapers like the New York Times or uh, US News and World Report or um, the Wall Street Journal. But then also there'll be kind of news articles that are more based for children or younger students and then within those news articles, they'll also be differentiated based on students' reading levels. So you might have a news article about, so I, I remember a couple of years ago when I was tutoring students, I gave my students news articles about the Black Panther movie because that had just come out and it was one of the first uh, Marvel or superhero movies where they had an African-American superhero. And it was a very uh, inspirational movie and popular movie. So I had students read about the importance of Black Panther, uh, the Black Panther movie, um, and I had students from different grade levels. I had high school students reading high school level uh, articles about that. I had an article that was similar, was at like an eighth grade reading level. I had an article for younger students that was at a fifth grade reading level, and even like kindergarten reading level. So basically they had the same overall content, but it was differentiated based on students' reading level. Another thing, we, we already kind of mentioned this, but have your grouping also supports uh, differentiation and supports, uh, so it supports students learning at their ability level, their differentiation, but also supports meaningful activities. And when you group ELL students, you want to group them um, in different ways and with different people, but um, you can group them 
First of all, with students that know that have more of content knowledge, so you, you want to have mixed ability or heterogeneous groups. So you want to group people who have maybe less content knowledge or less background knowledge with students that have a lot of background knowledge or much information about a given topic. So that way, the students with less background knowledge can learn from the students with more background knowledge. You also should make um, group students based on language ability. So you want to group students, you don't want to group all of the same level together in an ESL classroom because you want students to learn from each other. So if they're all at the same level, let's say they're all beginners, then they're not going to have a lot of modeling from their peers to help teach them new information. They're all going to kind of be at the same level. So if you do have stu ELL students at different levels, you want to group um, some lower level, like beginner or intermediate English language learners with some advanced and advanced high English language learners. This way, or even with native speakers. This way, the ELL students will get a model from the native speakers. They'll learn new vocabulary. They'll learn um, correct phrasing, more complicated, more complex, longer, elaborate phrasing when they're speaking and writing. They'll learn academic vocabulary. They'll learn um, correct pronunciation. And so all of those things will be beneficial. So you want to group uh, ELL students with native English speakers so that ELL students can learn from their native English speaker and peers. And then, of course, you, you need to provide small group teacher-led support. And when you're providing small group or teacher-level support, and that during that time, you might choose to group students by ability level or reading level um, just within your small group. And that's because you can teach similar topics to those students at the same time. Um, but when students are working on their own in small groups, you want to have a mixed ability group. So the nice thing about small group and teacher-led support, and this could be things like guided reading groups or maybe a, maybe a math support group or a science experiment group. The nice thing about this is that um, students get individualized, more individualized instruction because there's fewer students um, that are working with the teacher directly. So they get more attention from the teacher. They're more likely to be engaged and less off task. And um, many times they are able to um, receive more differentiation based on their specific level. So let's say students are in a fourth grade classroom, but they're reading at maybe a, a first grade reading level. Well, during that small group that's led by the teacher, the teacher can pull those students that are reading at a first grade reading level and help read with them texts that are at a first and second grade reading level that can help build students' knowledge and eventually with more and more individualized and differentiated small group instruction, students will eventually be at the um, on grade level ability, reading level. And then students are less likely to get off task as well. And it also builds kind of like uh, a community within your small group and so um, students appreciate that. And then um, some other meaningful activities, we kind of already talked about this. These are contextual supports. So it could be pictures, charts, digital jump starts, real objects, all of these anchor charts, all of these things would be visual contextual supports, which would be meaningful for English language learners. Um, having text that include embedded definitions, where they include um, a way for students to click or See, find the definition quickly without having to go to a dictionary can be very beneficial because it can help save students time and stress and it can immediately tell them what that word means. Closed sentences or passages are beneficial and meaningful for ELL students because it helps students learn vocabulary terms based on context. And a nice way to do this is to have closed passages or sentences in which students have visuals so they can guess what word goes in the blank with the support of the visuals. Outlines, we kind of already talked about that with um, guided notes, but it, those are helpful in organization and summarization of key topics. And then providing students various types of assessments is also a very meaningful activity that differentiates instruction. So at the end of your lesson, you want to provide different ways students to, can demonstrate their knowledge. Maybe they can act out what they've learned. Maybe they can do an oral presentation, or they can write, write something down, or write an essay, or create a poster, 
or create a project or even a piece of art to, and discuss it to explain what they've learned. Create a, a, their own story or their own rap to explain what they've learned. So it, this is nice because it provides students various ways to demonstrate their knowledge and it also is beneficial for different learning styles. You could even provide students assessment in their native language or have them present the topic in their native language. And um, this will be beneficial as well because students can show, hey, I understood the topic, I understand the lesson, um, I'm just still developing my English skills, but I can show you what I know about the content topic in math, science, social studies, or even language arts, but I can show you in my native language. All right, that's the, our first uh, presentation on the PSYOP book and model. Please stick tune for other presentations. Thank you very much for your attention.